Everything you do, you should paint everything. Even if you just want to do portraits and you just want to do heads, you should still do landscapes, you should still do a still life every once in a while. You should still draw hands and feet and you should draw dogs and horses. And everything you do gives you information that you can use on your portrait. Same as if you're painting a portrait and I always say, you're, you're just doing a head. And I always want you to know where the person is sitting because that affects the angle and the attitude of the head. And it's the same thing with painting landscapes. This helps when you're trying to paint an interior. You're trying to paint the depth in the room. And if you've painted mountains going back, you know, when you see great depth, it gives you this, the principles you need to paint much shallower depths. And, you know, just painting the model stand going back. A lot of people have a problem just making the model stand look like it's going back in the room. But if you've painted a field, <coughs> all of a sudden the model stand is not such a, a, a complex thing. It becomes a very simple idea. So, so we like to do all those things. And outdoor painting is, it's essentially the same thing. I consider all painting the same thing. And once you realize and you understand this, you'll have no fear of painting anything. Everything you paint is light on form in space. Everything is light on form in space. As long as you're doing representational, realistic, classical painting, it's always light on form in space. And if you're painting a landscape, you have much more space. You know, the light is much more uh, wild and uncontrolled than it is here. This is the most controlled painting you're ever going to do, is right in this room. So it's, so it's great to do all these different things. Um, the other thing that happens outdoors is you get, unless you're painting very early in the morning or very late at night, you have very uncontrolled shadows. You have a lot of reflection bouncing around everywhere because your light source is now not focused the way it is here. Uh, which is it's kind of fabulously fun because you, you can't just do your shadow value and then fill in your light values. You're, you're there's a lot more complexity to it. And you can have different kinds of light. Here it's essentially the same light all the time. But when you're outside and anybody who's done landscape painting on a, a partly cloudy day will know how different the light is. When you're standing there doing a sunny landscape and the sun goes behind a cloud and everything drops in intensity. <laughs> And you're waiting and waiting and waiting for the sun to come back out, and tapping your toes. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't, and your sunny landscape is finished. But the light can be very different on a, a sunny day and a cloudy day. And it's, it's exciting. And that also helps in here, because you, it helps you think about the space and the landscape around the model. So everything you do. You know, if we're doing this, I mean, I could easily see this as a still life with drapery set up in the foreground and you know, various objects about. You know, that helps with composition. So every, you know, every kind of painting is important. But let's see what we can do with some landscapes. And this is, Walter mixed up this beautiful palette. This is the, the way I learned how to do landscapes. This comes out of the 19th century. Before me was Frank Mason who studied with Frank Dumont, who studied in the French academies in the 19th century. Everybody who teaches in this room teaches for 50 some years. Mason taught for 57 years and Dumont taught for 59 years. And I've been here five years, so <laughs> add all that together, you're, you're, back, you're back to the 19th century in no time. And Dumont studied in Paris at the great academies and knew Whistler and knew Sargent and so this is how far back this goes. And it's a wonderful concept. And obviously, it comes out of the Impressionists. 
because this is all about value control. Oh, there's our white. Okay. I was going to say, we have no white. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but this is value control. I mean, if you take a picture of this and put it in black and white mode, these, every one of these rows of colors will look exactly the same. See, because Walter's that good. <laughs> Walter, Walter tested this at home. Too. But these are basically the value of the, the pure color below it. See, it's yellow light, yellow medium, and we move down. But it's a, it's a very good way to learn landscape painting because you can get to your colors quickly instead of wasting a lot of time trying to decide where you are in pitch. After you've done it for a long time, I don't use all this anymore. I just take the same indoor palette and I can just mix things outdoors quickly. So long as you know where you are in pitch. See, that's always that's the key to everything is knowing where you are in pitch all the time. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about the difference between a sunny day and a gray day. <coughs> Because that's, to me, that's very exciting. See, and this, I assume, is meant to be a sunny day? Half sun. Half sun? See, you don't, it, it's hard to tell. This is a gray day? Mm -hmm. This is this, currents? See, it's a gray day, it's a sunny day. The sun or, who's this? Night. It's gray. Sun? Gray. Yeah. Okay. See? Winter. This is Walter's? Sunny? Midday? Sun? Sunny? Sunny? Okay. So what's the difference? Well, we've got to decide on this, see? We've got to decide what we're going to do. Do you mind if I work on it? Or do you, you know, if it's, if you have a show coming up, I'll leave it. <laughs> but it's kind of fun, because it, it, I can see that you're intending to make it partly sunny, but it, it looks very gray. The whole thing has a, uh, a low intensity grayness to it. Now the thing that's tricky about outdoor painting, and indoor painting too, is everybody tries to paint the tonalities that they see in front of them. And when you do that, you can do a nice painting, but you, you lose the intensity of the light. So this is a light tone but it has no intensity of sunlight. Okay, so, and it's, it's hard, you know, when you're doing that half and half. Mm -hmm. When I go out on days like that. There was sun, like, in the distance, but everything else was... Okay. But, I mean, that's a very exciting thing. Uh, usually if I go out on one of those half sunny days, <coughs> I take two panels, and when the sun is out, I do this one, and when the sun goes behind the cloud, I do the other one because it's, it's very hard to, to control what you're doing. If you're, if you're trying to be in between, it's very hard. It's like doing a standing pose. You know, you're either standing with your weight split or you're standing with your weight on one foot. And when you go in between, you get sort of an awkward pose and nobody quite understands what's happening. Now it's the same thing. People want to know if it's sunny or it's not. So let's make the distance sunny. Let's make it brilliant. Now you've obviously tried to go up there. Let's do the sky a little bit. Let's bring some sunlight into the sky. It's obviously if you have sun breaking through here, you're gonna have some brilliance. Which way was the sun coming? Uh, from left to right, right to left? Left to right. Left to right, okay. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's just get something up. See, obviously, any time we're going higher up, you're getting more brilliant in the sky. The, only, the question I would have when I'm doing this is whether I'm going to make the light on the tree more brilliant in the sky or the sky more brilliant than the light on the tree. And it could be either. The either thing can happen. But let's do... Sure you don't mind because I'm going to completely mess this up. But I'm giving you fair warning. 
Do you have one chance to say no? <laughs> okay. Now, here's the excitement of this. You can take, and we're pretty high up here. We're up at, at yellow, maybe yellow light, yellow medium value up here. This is pretty high up. Now, this is the same thing as we're doing when we're doing figures. The more intense I want that light to be, the thicker I can make the paint. The thinner I make it, the less intense it's going to be. It's a very simple concept. But if I can pile this on here, really beautifully. Did you see the bellows show that was up at the Met? Mm -hmm. we went to the yeah, and, and it, you saw how thick that paint was. But he did it everywhere. See? Yeah. He wasn't as judicious as I am. See, I like to, to build it up in the lights. Big, big, big. The higher up you go, the bigger the paint gets and less and less. But already you're starting to see some daylight coming in. Now, if we want the sun to come from a certain direction, see, and this is what we were doing with Walter's painting last week. He was in the back of the room. We were trying to get the light coming into the painting. Instead of just painting this, we started bringing the light all the way from the skylight in. And it's the same thing here. And this is somewhat midday, right? Yeah. It's not early in the morning. No, yeah, it's more like uh, 3, 3, 4 o'clock. Okay. So let's bring, I'm going to use a little, Walter's got some nice thalo greens here. And it's, this is a relatively new idea. Thalos are relatively new. And you won't see this in too many paintings before, oh, even maybe the, the latter part of the 20th century that they started using it for landscapes. But it's a wonderful thing. It brings some of the yellow sunlight energy partly because it's a little more yellow than blue is, but also because the phthalo pigment itself is more chromatically intense. Therefore, it makes the sunlight more chromatically intense. And it's, it's really quite a brilliant thing. There's, you know, there's so many different levels you can think about painting. There's just so many incredible levels. But this will start bringing some sunlight energy into your sky. So if the sun is coming down from here, trees are now, right. now they're going into shadow. So it's hard to tell, is this in sun or is it in shadow? And you didn't decide. I, I can tell you just, you went back and forth. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't, and you sort of painted it in between. Um, but this brings some beautiful sunlight energy into your painting. And look how it goes right into your blue and nobody can tell the difference. Now, let's decide what we're going to do. This is obviously in shadow. That's the easiest thing in the world. And going down into shadow is... It's the easiest thing you can do. And Walter, you have great brushes here. If anybody wants to know how to take care of their brushes, they should talk to Walter. These are absolutely beautiful. Makes a difference. Mm -hmm. so if, you're, if you're going to paint, use the best material that you can find. You know, use a good panel, and use good paint, and use good brushes, and use good oil, and it makes a difference. If you're, it makes a difference if you're driving in a really good car, or you're driving in a clunker. It's going to break down. You know, you want to use the best of everything. If you're going to do the best painting in the world, you're going to do a masterpiece. You should use the best stuff so that it will last longer. And it, it makes it, actually makes it easier to express what you want to say. But here's your, your trees in shadow. Now, shadow is obviously the lower end of the palette. And depending what kind of trees you have, anything down here is going to work. And this is down at about red light, red medium value. And keep some of your 
your leafy greenness in your trees before you get too deep into your shadows. But look at the effect you have already. I mean, it's, real, it's starting to go outdoors now. See, it sort of looked like an indoor landscape when we started. It's a nice painting, but it looked like an indoor painting. See, this is the difference between the Barbizon School and the Impressionists. Barbizon School did beautiful things, fabulous things, but they're all very low in pitch, all very somber and quiet, and not exactly the French countryside. So, you know, so we can lift it up. So we're starting to lift that up in pitch. And there's your reflection in the water, the same thing. Um, now that we have some lights and some darks, now we can decide what we want to do in here. So you decide if it's going to be in sun, out of sun. See if you want a, just a blast of sunlight on this tree. But it, it looks like you have an effect that's coming, the light is coming this yeah. way into your painting. Right. And catching a little bit here. Catching it on, from, on the left side. Yeah. So let's do this. So how can we do, how can we push these or back behind that mass, right? So if you want to go back a little bit farther, how do you do that? Cool. It's, it's anytime you're going back, it's, uh, it gets a little bit higher in pitch. So it goes up a little half a step. It gets a little grayer, a little bluer. And the reason it does that is because you're getting more layers of atmosphere between you and the object. That's the only difference. When you're looking at uh, a mountain range, you know, the trees very close to you are dark and rich and green and powerful. And the farther away you go, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and grayer and bluer until the mountain range in the distance looks very light blue. But it's actually the same trees that are right in front of you. It's just you have layers of atmosphere between you and those trees. So let's just put a, a little layer of atmosphere between you and those trees. And I'll just take a little of the green local leaf of the tree and lift it up a little bit with some gray. And we're still way in the middle of the palette. If you can see this, um, we're still in a middle tone. So as we come back here, see already without doing anything else, It's already going back in the painting. Just, just totally, it's going back in the painting. Now, how am I putting this on the canvas? It's a middle tone. It's not a shadow. I don't want to go transparent. And I don't want to go as big and fat as, as the biggest lights. But it, it's in the middle. It makes a very nice middle tonality. Is this reflecting in the water too? I'm guessing if this is reflecting in the water, I'm assuming this is going to reflect in the water too. And what is what's happening here? Is that the reflection from here? Yes, reflection all the way out, all the way out here. Yeah, well, there. Yeah, you know, I'm. I'm see, that's my first landscape. So I'm looking. This is your first landscape. Oh, oh well, you should have told me that. You could keep it. <laughs> judge all your, for, for judge all the other ones. Uh, uh, so um, there's kind of a darkness. Perhaps some of the darkness I'm seeing are the effect of among, among the opposite shore of the lake of trees that are cast in shadow. Some of the shadow is, is you know, some, some of the light is being reflected from the sky as the water's rippling. And some of the shadow from distant trees and some shadow That would be the shadow out here. Probably, yeah. yeah. Um, but this reflection is this mass of trees. Yes. Okay. And the only reason I question that is because there was some light in between. Yeah, it was kind of like yeah. the, the water was rippling okay. as it was coming through uh, the river area here. Okay, the not at all. The changed, you know, from, from the sky reflection to the Okay, reflection. we'll come back to that. Um, but let's get the sun dancing on the trees first, because that's probably why you stopped to paint there. It's, it's, 
every once in a while I drive around, since I live in the country, I drive around looking for what I think are nice spots to paint. And nine times out of ten, I'll go back to the same spot that I drove by, and it will just be the dullest place in the world. And it was exciting when I first went there because of the time of the day and the, the way the light was falling on something. And you go back and it's just objects, it's just trees. It's, it was ridiculous. Why did, I, why did I ever think that was exciting in the first place? But it's the light. So it's always the light that's exciting. You know, sitting here looking at you, everybody has a little top light on their head. It's very exciting. <laughs> but let's go. Let's paint sunlight coming in here. And you went after it as a yellow sunlight. Yellow sunlight on yellow kind of yellowish. Oh, yellowish trees. Oh, you're sort of in the fall landscape here. Is this recent? Yeah, it's recent. Oh, so just spring. Spring. Oh, okay. Spring and fall are sometimes hard to tell the difference. You know, one has, the fall has bigger leaves catching the color, but spring greens look very much the same as an autumn scene. But, but it's just with, with a much smaller leaf. Yeah, but the color is the same. Yeah, but, the, but this is great. Spring greens, OK. Spring greens. Let's go with spring greens. And I want to be brilliant now. This is going to be sunlight in the spring. And it's fabulous. Here's the highest little green that we have. So with that high green, <coughs> which has a lot of yellow in it. So does that have a little bit of phthalo green in it too? Okay, so that helps with that intensity. Well, if that comes in here and comes from behind those trees and starts catching on this, this little tree, and oh my god, you have sunlight intensity. Wow. See, now I'm not copying the tonality of the tree. I'm painting the energy of the sun. See, does it come out of sunlight? Yeah. See? And then as it comes across, it can, it can decrease and be less and less as it hits each of the trees. And if there's a little something down here. But it's sunlight energy, see? It's, it's, you're painting, it's not just painting the tree, you're painting the light on the tree. That's a, a big difference than what most people will tell you about landscape. Most people will tell you to paint the landscape. They paint the tree, they're painting the object. But we're painting the, the light and the object and the space. We're painting all three of those. And I just mix this with the middle green that we had. So if we decide there's a shadow on this tree, back with some shadows against that. And I'm not trying to paint a tree at this point. This is just sort of uh, what I used to call as a student, I used to call them blobscapes. <laughs> but I'm just showing you the tonalities. And without painting as a specific tree, you already have something exciting. Now you have some, some beautiful little Shruggy. trunks, trunks and shrubs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things. You can come in here and have all kinds of fun with the light catching things. And have the light dance across your painting. And was there anything hitting on that mask? Uh, actually, that, you know, it was transparent. Or you can see this, this is the development now. It's not full development. The light fluid from yeah. the distance. And that's... You can start getting the light coming through a tree, and it, you can do this, and you can really make the light dazzle through there if you want, and make it move with your brushwork. But it's you can do anything. Gosh, it's so damn exciting. And this is, you know, a little bit harder because we're not out there in front of the scene, so this is all theory. But 
I can dance through there. So you never do these things in a hurry. And you had some red branches or leaves or something. Yeah, right here, there's water. Yeah. Okay, just, but here I am at that same value, see? It's easy just to throw some red into that same value and play that against your sunlight. Okay, so we can still have all the things you have. But now we're bringing the energy into it. So then some of it comes down and hits the water. No? Sunlight on the water? Yeah. You're making it too easy. <laughs> but sunlight on the water is just incredibly exciting. And gosh, I'm not sure I would hesitate. <coughs> All the way up to white. <laughs> this is this is light skimming across the water and it comes between the masses, between that mass and the mass in front. And less and less as it comes forward. Now, what about the shadow? So you want to go down into shadow in the front. Water in shadow, sort of shadow, midday. This, this, this is the thing. It's good. Yeah, it, it's midday, so it's not so intensely dark. The beginning and the end of the day, you get true shadows. See so what? What is a shadow? See, this is my wife did this to me during. A, I was doing this for an art center once. I had them bring in paintings, and I was talking about shadows. And Elizabeth's job was to put the paintings up and take them down and, 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 tell, and, and to hurry me up so I wouldn't spend 45 minutes on each painting. But I was talking to somebody about their painting and I said, well, here you're going into shadow. And then a few minutes later I said, you know, if you're going to go deeper into that, then you can go into accent. I said, There's a, you can have an accent in there. And I was, you know, I, I don't mind people asking questions when I'm teaching. Because there are, sometimes I say confusing things and it's better if you understand what I'm saying. So Elizabeth raised her hand. She says, what's the difference between shadow and accent? What do you mean by shadow? And we just sort of throw these things around, you know, casually. I mean, as I'm looking at you, I'm seeing all of you in shadow little bit of light on the tops of your head. But what does that mean? Is that the same thing as the shadow underneath the rack of pallets? See, as I look back, there, there are different things. But shadow is the absence of direct light. And within that, you can have indirect light. You can have reflected light. There's a lot of reflected light coming back here. So the shadow is the absence of direct light. Light. It's a very simple way to put it. The absence of direct light. And then accent, when you have an accent, when you're going into a cave or into a mouth or a nostril, is the absence of all light. They're very different things. It starts giving degrees. And everybody has, they understand the degrees of light and shadow. Everybody understands this. You know, all the, the close values when you're painting light, the half tones and the highlights. And when they get to the shadows, it just gets dark. See, this happens even with bellows. See, the, the swimmers we were looking at in the bellows show. We did the beach scene and everything was in light. Beautiful subtleties, absolutely fabulous subtleties. But when he had the swimmers against the dark trees, the trees just went dark and dead. And there, were, there was no subtlety at the bottom of the palette. If you can do that, 
you open up a whole new range. So we can go into some, see what is shadow now in the water? See, it's, this is not a complete absence of light when you're painting the shadow on the water in the midday. You still have the sky coming down. Or you still have some light coming from, not directly from the sun, but from the sky and from, as the, the light is bouncing off the sky, it's coming back into things. It's very hard to find real true shadows outdoors. But let's do some water. Let's take your water down. And now you want it to be lower in pitch. Okay. How do we get this down so it's lower in pitch and doesn't look ridiculously dark? You don't want it to be this dark. You don't want water that's, that's all the way down here. See, that starts to look sort of ridiculous. And that's nighttime. But we can have a shadow because we know how high up the light is. Anything that gets lower than that can start to be shadow. If you're painting shadow on white satin, it's very different than if you're painting a shadow on black velvet. The water is more like the white satin. So you can have something that's relatively high up, it's not the blue in it. We're in the middle of the palette. And I'll take some of the blue and I'm just mixing it right into what we had for the trees, the greens, the reds, everything. It's in the middle of the palette. And the less chromatically intense it is, the better. And as I mix the greens and the red into it, it makes it less chromatically intense. So that's going to make it more like a shadow. <coughs> if I mix the same thing and make it an intense blue, I could take the same value. Here it is at, at a, a middle value. Where would this be if I put it in your, your trees in the distance? It's, it's about the same thing. It's about the same value. But here it's, it's, it starts to be the shadow in the water. It's clearly sunlight and shadow. It's very clear. And that's all you that's what you want to tell the viewer. I said it's this is sunlight, that's shadow. You know what else can you have happen to this? This is this is basically what you need to finish this painting. From here, you can now use nature. Once you've organized your painting into sunlight and shadow, you can now use nature to find the personalities of the trees and the shadows and the leaves and all the different things. Same way as you have different personalities when you're painting portraits. This is different, for, this is where indoor painting helps your landscape. If you've done portraits, you can now do a portrait of that tree and do a really fabulous portrait with character and, and personality. And when the cows come marching in here, then you can paint the cows with their personalities. And but let's see if we can find, this is a couple more thoughts. Let's see if we can find them, some lower shadows as you're going down under the trees. And we haven't gone very far down yet. But let's just drop down here a little bit. And this is just, you can do it with a simple gray. You can do it with pretty much anything you want. Um, anything that drops down lower starts to look a little bit more like a shadow and not coming forward. And then you, you try and you do different things. See, the Impressionists might come down here and throw some violet into it. And why would they do that? Why are they putting violet in the shadows? It's the complement to the sunlight. So it makes the sunlight look sunnier. You know, these are these are brilliant thoughts, but they're they're very simple thoughts. So they might make this a little more violet. And there's your tree going up there. And of 
course, if we do that, then it reflects a little bit into the water. So then we can come back with your our general three tonalities that we have in here. So are reflections lighter or darker than the things they reflect? Reflections are always lighter. They can't be more powerful than than mm -hmm. what they're right than the object itself. <coughs> so we'll just lift it up. And bring your water back in. See, now it's now it's really simple to bring color back into your water. Easiest thing in the world to bring color back in. Now that we know where we are in pitch. can happen. Now you had a cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Clouds aren't that hard. It's just a form. And obviously if the, the sun is coming in this direction, the light is on that part of the cloud. subtle cloud. But it's a form. So if the light is coming in one direction, the shadow comes in the other direction. And how do you do a shadow on a cloud? Shadow on, on light. It can be any number of things, depending on how powerful, how big a shadow, it is, how big a cloud it is how much of the light is being blocked. You can have light coming through clouds. You can have light being blocked from the underplanes. And at this time of day, I doubt it was very deep. Or just a little something. Give it a little underplane. But I think it's starting to come along. It's, it's not bad at all. What would you like to see happen to that? There can be. You can have reflection of some of the sunlight of the trees. Uh, so this is this is where it's so easy just to, to slide up your, your palette. I mean, just to go. Same thing I do all the time in here. It's just move up. Same as you're moving on a piano. Just, just glide right up. But yeah, you could have some reflections in the water of the sunlight. It's subtle. You can have a lot of subtleties. But now we're playing everything. Once we moved all the way up into the sunlight, now we're playing the same as in here. You're playing 90% of the painting within one or two octaves. Water's rippling. Like in the foreground, I said, even if it's not like the wind, you know, blowing, in the foreground, you can't just like some ripple. Well, a ripple is not that hard. And what is a ripple? It's where the water, the ripple is a reflection of the sky. It's a form. Hmm. So you're creating a form. Once, once the water ripples, Instead of being a flat plane, it now starts to have a side plane and a top plane. And so if you think of it that way, as the water comes out of being plane, it starts to go up on the side. And of course, the, the light is going to come from wherever the sun is. So it's going to catch a little bit and then disappear. And you can follow the ripples right through the water. And as long as you're painting them as forms, you can't miss. It's always, always a form. And, in, you know, theoretically it has a little shadow on it. Do you really want to put a little shadow on every ripple? You can. You can have dark ripples, too. 
and those are just shadow planes. And if you want more, so depending on where you are, what the weather is, and the wind direction, and the wind direction, and gosh, if you want wind on those trees, it's something else. If you want to bring some more color into your foreground, so long as we know where we are in pitch, so theoretically, we can bring color in. Anything's possible. And you make all these decisions when you're out there in nature. This is why we go outside instead of just making it up. And if you look at a lot of uh, early Innis paintings, they're made up landscapes. You know, he was just painting the theory and he, he made designs that he thought worked well and, and he knew how to like the trees <clears throat> and how to paint the trees and, and he made them up. And you look at those, and then you look at the later ones, where he actually goes out in nature and, and paints. They're very different. They're very different. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. Innes is a remarkable painter. Probably one of the most underrated painters there ever was. Um, anyway, I think that's coming along. It's starting to look a little sunnier, cheerier. Mm -hmm. That help a little bit to make any sense at all. Um, it, it, it's very tricky. 